Check, check. All right, can we get the panelists to their seats, please? One, two, three, four, five, six. Lovely. I'll leave this right here. Tanner Beard, ladies and gentlemen. Tanner Beard. Tanner Beard. Anybody? Big guy. My guy. We good to go? Good to go. Good to go. Lovely. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the pitch. This is our third year doing this. Now, before we even start, I want to remind everyone, yes, this is a competition. However, all of your creators here, all of you are doing the exact same thing. There's so much magic in this room, so please, if you don't take anything out of this, make a friend. Uh, you can really learn from everybody up here, and these people right here, an absolute wealth of knowledge, everything they say, please, please, it's all constructional. This is basically a workshop-type environment. Um, we do want to give a big shout-out to Path Water as well. We want to give a shout-out to Honey Drop, but more importantly, the one and only Marina Studios and Compelling Pictures. A round of applause for them. So you're wondering what you're competing for. You're going to come on up here. You're going to give your pitch. The grand prize is one week of full studio time at Marina Studios, valued over $45,000. Anybody here use that? Anybody can here use that? All right. All right, folks. Well, we're about to get this thing going. We got the judges up here. Sorry, my phone's acting up here. All right. Now, let's go over the rules real quick. Everybody that comes up here, you're going to have five minutes to pitch. We'll have a timer over here. Steven Garcia will be our timer as well as our moderator this evening. You have five minutes to pitch. After that, we'll have five minutes for critique and Q&A. The winner will be announced tomorrow night at the awards. Is there any questions, comments, concerns? All right, well, let's get these panelists going. Uh, Mr. Garcia, if you can introduce yourself, give us a little bit about yourself. We go on down the row. After that, it is your floor. Thank you, Noor. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Steven Garcia. I'm the head of content development for Compelling Pictures. Um, worked with the film festival. I've got the honor of being a founding board member, uh, working with Tanner and, and Tomic and Alexander Shando for quite some time. So this is our third pitch panel, I believe. Um, gets better every time. And uh, thank you for coming out early. We're excited to hear some pitches. Pass it over to Jordan. Hey, I'm Jordan Foley. I'm a producer. I have three movies here at the festival this year. Uh, Who Are You People is premiering today at 3.30, so please join. Uh, Gossamer Folds is tomorrow, and The Abandoned I Executive Produced uh, is also tomorrow. The, the shameless self-plug. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. It's good. It's good. Hi, I'm Marina Cappy, owner of Marina Studios. She's, she's putting up the studio time, folks. Hi, I'm uh, Jay Beattie. I'm a TV writer, showrunner. Uh, I'm showing Peacock <clears throat> now called The Lost Symbol. You can watch, but nothing here at the, at the festival, but uh, happy to be here. Excited to get it going. Hey, guys. Maurice Fadida. I'm a producer and a financier, and uh, <laughs> happy to be here. Hi, I'm Jeff Stoltz. I, uh, I'm here to audition for these guys. To try to <laughs> Both of my shows just got fucking canceled, so I need a job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just like you guys. All right, so I want to break down just a little bit of what to be prepared for today. Um, essentially, for those of you who came today thinking, uh, you know, you're just going to get a little time with us and we're not going to be too hard on you, you are incorrect. This is, a, this is a very, this is a workshop, but it's also a little bit of a boot camp. So we want to make sure that you guys know your stories inside and out. You know your characters. Um, if you can con consolidate your film into a log line, that's always great. Um, you know, a pitch is important because as filmmakers, you have to be good storytellers, but this is the one part of your job where you have to be story sellers. So it's just one moment where five minutes could mean the difference between your movie going or not. So when you come up here, I want to make sure you guys tell us a little bit about your personal story, why you're connected to this creative. Um, you should always try to hit something about why you and why now. That's going to be important for studios. It's going to be important for streamers because when they choose to green light content, they want to know that there's going to be an audience for it. So, you know, you're not going to say, oh, I've got a pirate movie when Pirates of the Caribbean just, you know, closed four years ago. It's probably not very timely for a pirate film. So just keep that in mind when you're pitching out your stories. Why you? Why now? Why it's important? Um, then hit your, you hit your story summary. That's going to be you selling us your big idea, walking us through your big idea, and letting us uh, hear it from your point of view as the filmmaker. So we want to see some passion there. 
Um, then get into your character descriptions, if there's any details in there that you think are important. Um, and then we will, you'll probably have five minutes at that point. And then we'll do some Q&A, ask you a little bit more about some, some of your story points. And then we'll give you some very, very honest feedback on your pitch. So, everybody ready? Yeah. All right. Uh, we'll go in order, I guess. Uh, Gregory Michael. Good morning. Can you hear me? There we are. I'm going to put this around. I want to say thank you very much, and I, this is such an honor to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity to pitch for you guys this morning. <laughs> that was on purpose. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about my sh show, Norman. Norman is about that time in your life when you realize your dreams it might be, it might time to, it may be time to give up your dreams just to make ends meet. It's a coming of middle age story. It's a situational, multi-cam sitcom, and it takes place in off-strip Las Vegas. It revolves around a group of four individuals that are awkward and diverse, and for every Celine Dion and Lady Gaga, Elton John that headlined the Las Vegas trip, there are countless other individuals, entertainers, musicians that are struggling as hard as they can to try to make it, make their dreams come a reality. And at the heart of it all is just like that dreamer is Norman. He's a lovable loser. He's an off strip lounge pianist singer, and he moonlights as a gondolier at the Venetian. <laughs> and then we have Marcy, lives across the apartment complex from Norman. She's known Norman for the last 20 years, since band camp, high school band camp days. She's an ex-showgirl turned real estate agent, and she's had more one-night stands than a Motel 6. <laughs> and then we have Donna, and probably my favorite character, Donna, is Marcy's roommate, best friend. She's proud, strong woman, and has very conservative leanings. Oh, and she's transgender. And then we have Charlie, who's semi-permanently living on Norman's couch. Uh, he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, but you might probably find a joint or a saxophone where that spoon used to be. So this is very much a sitcom. Okay, very much so. It's not a musical, but this show has a lot of music in it. In fact, my team has created original music for every single episode of this show. Composed by award-winning composers, music writers. We have songs, original songs, original music, along with the hits that you all love and know. And they're gonna be creatively presented in very cool ways through flashback, through end credit rolls, and they're always gonna be performed by our cast of characters and guest stars. We're gonna see Norman at his music gigs. We're gonna see our cast of characters in an impromptu wedding band. We're also gonna see Charlie get a job at a DJ, as a DJ in a day club, and realizing it's just a bar mitzvah. But at the center of it all, in the heart of Norman, is Marcy and Norman. They've known each other for the last 20 years since the band camp days. And they're the ones we're really gonna be rooting for because like them, sometimes in our life we feel like we're not appreciated. And we all know what that feels like. And we all had just wished that maybe we can grasp that brass ring. And will they be that for each other? Maybe we'll have to watch 10 seasons of episodes to find out. <laughs> and that is Norman. Nice. And, and Marina Studios is perfect for Norman because it's a multicam sitcom. Nothing's better to work in a, a soundstage studio space like a multicam. Awesome. Great job, great job. Another round of applause for him. I like that the phone rang because you might encounter that, in a, especially with a TV sitcom. You're going to be pitching to probably, you know, 
two to three execs at a time. Some of them are taking calls, texting. It's it, you probably know, Jay. It's, it's 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 a busy room sometimes. Yeah, especially a comedy room. It's going to be a lot tougher. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, let's kick off some feedback. I had some questions actually Please. about uh, about Norman. So I, I didn't get a sense of what does he want and does he get it. So why are we rooting for him? Why are we going on this? He's the musician in Vegas who wants to be the headliner. So that's his dream is just to be name and lights. Yes. That's he's okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Anybody else can jump in if you got I had questions. kind of the similar thing, but as a headliner, you mean like he wants... You know, a name on the, st on, on the lights on the strip. Right, he wants the MGM stage. But he's off like, strip, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he's off strip, right. Because I don't know that anybody, everybody understands exactly the, the nuances of the Vegas you know, okay. businesses, you know. So, like, you're a lounge singer. I'm like, well, what is your, you know, what's the brass ring here, you know? Yeah, the brass ring is in that name in the marquee lights. Yeah. You know, Caesar's Palace, here's Norman instead of O'Shea's Casino, which is about three right. miles off the strip. And you know, they, their, their deal is the buffet fish and chips. Right, and yeah. what are the obstacles to that for him? Because I didn't really hear in there, like, what are, like how has he failed? He's, he's, all, he, he's auditioning, years. he's still auditioning. He's, you know, he's middle-aged, 38-ish. Uh, he's, he's auditioning to, to work with Britney Spears in her residency as the pianist. Uh, as a vocal, you know, as a, ba as a backup vocalist, he wants to be in all those shows we've heard of on the Las Vegas Strip, um, and he's very much that dreamer. Yeah, that's an interesting angle. If he's maybe even consulting with people who are already there. Yes, that's ex that's a, and that's what our because, series tackles. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, I thought it was interesting that when you said the character probably should give up on his dreams, you were looking at me. Uh, <laughs> But, like, like, right down. So, when I, uh, when I pitch comedy before... Norman? Yeah, exactly. Am I looking at Norman right now? <laughs> Jeez. You said middle yeah. age and called him 38. That, that hurt too, man. No, that <laughs> hurt me. Uh, so, th these guys are right. Pitching comedy is a, it's, it's a, a little bit more loose, wild. There will be people that will... There will be assistants sitting in there that are asking questions just to sound... Uh, important, but the one thing that I didn't get the sense of, and every time I pitch comedy and clearly didn't sell them, is um, we, like where are we going from start to finish for the for the for the first season and then beyond. Like they'll get. I think you need to be have a little bit more of a sense of that. Leave less doubt, but still keep it vague enough so it sort of seems like it's also the buyer's idea. Like so they're a part of it. Um, you're specific and there's great ideas here. I mean, I, I can picture these characters. Uh, I just think that in the pitch. You, you need to be a little bit more specific um, as start to finish and then beyond. That's great note, season. thank you. As, as a uh, sitcom, typically you're most likely pitching network. I mean, they're, obviously there's starting to be more places for sitcoms, but that is typically a 22 to 24 episode, as you know. Um, so you just kind of, that's what they want to hear. They want to know that you have that. Yes, yes. I mean, and obviously I handed that to you up there. I have a, like, you know, episodes. But it's hard, because I, I, I thought we only had three minutes, but it's five minutes, so please ask more questions. I know so much about this show. You know, I, I wanted to piggyback on what Jeff said, because it's like, uh, my job is head of content. I still have to pitch. I don't know if you guys knew that, but like, well, I'm still pitching show ideas, doc ideas, feature film ideas. We still have to get stakeholders involved from studios to distributors to actors to agents. So one thing I was missing that I usually like to hit if I'm pitching episodic is, so in the pilot, you're going to see. Walk me through that clean, like Jeff's saying. Tell me in the pilot you're going to see, which then is going to kick off this journey of self-discovery through the series that will follow. So it's hit the pilot, hit the series, and walk us through both those arcs. Okay. You know. Yeah, it feels like you have all that. That's clearly in here and in your head. Yeah. They don't. We don't. Sure. Yeah. And they just want to feel that people are buying things, and you guys can say, speak on this. Your idea may be amazing, but they're, they want to know that you can deliver. So they're gonna, that's, they want to make sure that, that, that's why you see things everybody does, and especially you guys. You're going to be like, what the fuck is that? They, why did they make that? That's terrible. My idea is better. And you're probably right, but they're buying it based on execution. Sure. And that's why people that have one thing that worked keep getting shots at other thing that, things that worked. And, I, you know, to, to follow up on that, when I... I, this idea came to me, came to my uh, uh, phone call I got from uh, essentially the guy who's Norman, 
the composer that is writing a lot of these songs. Uh, Jamie Hosmer, he's toured with Toto, Asia, Journey. Uh, he's got all the big headline names, but he's not made that brass ring of his name. You don't know his name. But he's been there, you know? And we all kind of know that. Um, we know that because of our industry, but, but that's everybody. We all have these dreams where we feel like we might have to give up on them. Uh, the time's too, you know, time's short. We gotta make ends meet. Um, and, then, and then my writer, uh, along with Jamie, it, they both came together, is Dennis Blair. He, uh, he headlined the Vegas Strip with George Carlin for 20 years. He, opened a, he, he, he wrote for the guy, and, and he's an Oscar-nominated writer. And he, he, uh, he wrote for Rodney Dangerfield, another one of those dreamers. So he wrote the series, the three of us wrote the series together. We co-created it. So we know what execution <laughs> is. We know what it is. Uh, we know how to do it. It's, you know, it's getting those opportunities, right? And yeah. um, that's, you know, that's why I'm here today. I mean, I would have led with the Oscar-nominated writer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not just the execution, it's auspices sometimes. So, yeah, that's it's who, nice to know that you, yeah, you've got that composer uh, and, the, and that writer. Have they, worked, have they worked in network comedy before? Yeah, uh, yeah Dennis Blair Dennis has. has. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely important to know. And I think the, I, the fact that he's a real person there's, there's some personal journey there. Yeah. So I think I probably would have led with a little bit of the inspiration came from real life. This is a real person. This yeah. is a real struggle because then um, some execs will think, okay, that's like the story behind the story we can release uh, when, when it's time to go to press, et cetera. So they're always thinking, you know, 12 months ahead when TCA's hit and they got to do their premiere for the pilot, well, let's let's have the, the real Norman get interviewed by Variety, et cetera. So that's always going to be just little sprinkles you can put on top of it. Awesome. So. Now, you're, a, you're a, also a writer? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. yeah, just for everybody in the room, if you're a executive producer in television, um, and Jay, you can probably speak to this better, but if you're a non-writing EP, it's sometimes the network's gonna force you out, so you better get your hands dirty and write a little bit, so. Um, cool, That's anybody true. else? Mm. I wanna ask you a challenging question. Sure. So, all of us are in the industry, we're all, always trying to make it, right? <coughs> Even when you make it, you're still trying to, you keep going, you want to make it, and you have your dreams and wishes and wants, and, and, and your you know, trajectory in the industry goes ups and, ups and downs. And I relate to it, and I think that everybody in this room relate to it. The question is, does it have broad appeal to just the average Joe that is, doesn't have those type of dreams? You know, I, I, it's, it's a great question. Thank you for that question. I, 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 I agree with you, and I, I will say for the limited people that I've talked to that are not in this business, it, this is, like I said, it's a coming of middle age story, but it's a story that's prompt, it's, it's happening more and more. I know we, we talk about off strip Vegas and music and entertainment, but the other characters, you know, they're not in entertainment per se. And it is a story that, not just in America, we're all living more and more these days. We're not growing up and leaving the homestead right away. You know, it's not 25 and you're out and you're getting married. We're, we're talking 35, 40. You know, you're just falling in love with the first time at 40 years old. You're, you know, it's, it's that. That's where it's identifiable for everyone. Cool. Anybody else? Cool. Yeah. Thank you very much. Nice work. Thank you. All right, next up on the list, let's see, Allegra. It's Allegra in the audience. <clears throat> My name is Allegra Ricci. I'm a writer-director from Italy, um, but I currently reside in New York. Um, I graduated recently from NYU uh, with a BFA in film and TV, and my thesis film is showing today at Mammoth. And my name is Aspen Nelson, and I also graduated from NYU recently, and I was a producer on Sparkle, her thesis film. And, um, we're here because we are really focused on finding women-centered narratives that platform unheard perspectives in really unique ways, and we think our feature film, Spring Break, does that in a really unique way. Um, so now to the story. Uh, we are pitching Spring Break, again, a feature film written and, written and directed by me and produced by Aspen. Uh, this is a coming-of-age, late bloomer uh, dramedy uh, that revolves around a mother and a daughter. The logline is, uh, while on a retreat, um, Catherine makes it her mission to help her 25-year-old daughter, Ellie, lose her virginity. Um, along the way, 
they realize that their relationship is not as strong as it used to be because of the years of distance, uh, and so they have to deal with that. So it's kind of an odd topic, but we're using this as a way to pose daring questions that challenge some while it's semi-relatable for others on these topics and how we as a society view them, namely intimacy, womanhood and motherhood, and also the concept of virginity. Um, back to the story. Uh, so basically, Ellie and Catherine have had always a very close relationship that kind of fell apart once Ellie had to move away uh, for college and never moved back. Uh, at this time, they decided to spend spring break, their spring break, uh, at a retreat, at a spy retreat in upstate New York. Um, and once uh, Ellie, once Ellie confesses that she's never had sex before, she really wants to. She really, really wants to. Uh, Catherine is actually kind of happy about it because she can spend time with her daughter and like help her with something so intimate. So when they get to the retreat and they find that there's a young guy there whose name is Guy, uh, who's staying with them, uh, they actually um, uh, Catherine pushes Ellie to ask him out and maybe she'll have sex with him finally. Uh, so she does, but she gets rejected, and she blames her mother for it because she pushed her. Um, so they have a huge fight. Uh, everything comes out, and then they return home, barely speaking. A few months later, Ellie's about to do it. She's finally doing it, but she panics when she sees him naked. <laughs> and so she go runs to the bathroom, calls her mother, who helps her uh, through her anxiety, and she finally does have sex. So happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that was on purpose. <laughs> so similar to other films of the genre, our inspirations want to couple the recent coming of age and family dramedy movies. We'll be leaning very heavily into an indie and realistic look that is balanced by com a comedic take on taboo and hard to talk about issues. So our main comps are Lady Bird, Obvious Child, and The Meddler. Um, as for casting, we're thinking for Ellie, a Beanie Filston kind of type. Uh, so very awkward, kind of selfish, but with some kind of underneath, or an Alana Haim kind of um, presence. So cool, but not too cool. And she's very insecure, but she thinks she's better than everybody else. Uh, and then for Catherine, we're thinking of a Melissa McCarthy type. So uh, somebody who has very strong comedic leanings and can play a big personality, or Catherine Hahn, who it's kind of sorts, sort of neurotic personality, uh, just very in her own world, she thinks differently of everything. So our ideal audience is daughters, so women under 25 and mothers, women over um, 50. So we want to do this because um, pre-pandemic audiences 50 plus were at least a third of the movie going population. So with that in mind, if we do have a theatrical release, that can be secured in that way. Also, um, younger audiences under 30 are those consuming um, content the most and setting consumer trends, especially when it comes to streaming services. So by, doing, by targeting these two groups, whether we end up with distribution, streaming, or both, we'll have um, two very important groups out of the way. So we have an audience that's already established. Um, yeah, so we also made a proof of concept recently uh, that uh, is trying <laughs> to get traction and attention uh, through social media and uh, festivals uh, exhibitions, and we would love to share it if you want to watch it. I don't know if we're allowed to, but <laughs> yeah. So this is our timeline. It's fairly quick. It would be a 15-day working shoot, and we'd have like a pretty small crew, so fairly quick and easy to do. Um, we currently have a line producer working on our budget, um, still working on our budget. It's a micro, a micro budget uh, feature film, and right now the estimate is about two hundred and thirty-eight thousand uh, dollars. And um, yeah, I mean to say that uh, that to be greenlit today by you today would be life-changing is an understatement. Uh, we uh, having the possibility to shoot on a soundstage would give us the opportunity to bring the retreat to life, which is the core of the film. It's basically the entire film. <laughs> so, yeah. 
So just to conclude, as hopeful trailblazers, even just this partial funding will make us so much closer to reaching our goal of transforming this genre. We want this film to provide a new kind of representation not seen before for the Losing Your Virginity film, <clears throat> where late bloomers, older women, and those feeling awkward about sex in general can see themselves in a new light. By creating more nuanced conversations in a humor humorous way, audiences can find somewhere that they relate to and are challenged by while also being entertained and endeared. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And Who wants to kick things off? I got a question. Uh, so I kind of tracked the mother-daughter relationship there, but uh, is Guy, is he the same guy through the thing? Oh, no. Uh, okay. He rejects her, and then at the end, a few months later, we kind of have a jump, and uh, basically Ellie's best friend who's moving on through life, she's getting married, and which makes Ellie even more anxious, of course. Uh, she finally introduces her to this guy who is nice, he's a nice guy. Uh, his name is Nick, poor guy. Okay, so this nice Nick kind of pops in at the end and he hasn't been established at all earlier? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, my question was just why? Is mom trying to get you know her daughter laid because yeah. it's ex unexpected and funny, but uh, you you have a sense that there's a bigger story there that you didn't tell, mm -hmm. right? What is the mom's backstory like? Yeah. What did she experience as it growing up, and how did she lose her virginity? What did she want for her daughter, and why mm -hmm. is she pushing this? You know, was there some like fracture in the relationship that she's trying to repair by this, which is a strange way to go mm -hmm. about it, which is something you can embrace, yeah. of course, but like, you talk a lot about the social relevance of the film, and I think it's interesting in a time where we're being more sex positive to explore just this, mm -hmm. this issue, but I'm not hearing all of the story there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, of course, I mean, this is heavily inspired by my mother, who's uh, all up in my business. This is not a biographical, okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Could have led with that. So, um, <laughs> yeah. mothers like that exist, uh, I promise you, I have her. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's a lot of, like, um, like, she's 25, Ellie's 25, uh, she's lived away from home for so long, and the mother is kind of like, she's at her, like at a stage in her life when she, it's hard to make friends because she all knows everybody in the town and she doesn't know who to hang out with. And this might make her feel a little bit younger and somebody who's like going through that again. And yeah, her, she's mar much more sex positive than her daughter. And she wonders what's wrong with that? What did I do wrong uh, in raising her that like, I'm all, I'm fine with sex and all of that and my daughter cannot talk to anybody. So, yeah. You know, it, it was, I had a question about um, mm -hmm. any kind of cultural uh, specificity, right? Is, mm -hmm. is it, um, I kept thinking to like films like Shiva Baby, which just mm -hmm. hit, and it's a festival darling. A friend of ours was a DP on that film, Maria. Um, and like big, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, it was like are these little tiny cultural nuances that mm -hmm. make the film. Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of cultural nuance uh, with the mother um, mm -hmm. in your film? Yeah, uh, well, I'm from Italy, so uh, there's definitely a different culture uh, that I noticed when I came here uh, for school, but um, right now it's not really written in the script uh, that there are any kind of uh, non-American, uh, but I've been considering that heavily, uh, kind of like the mother is an immigrant and the, uh, the daughter isn't, so there's like this kind of like fracture uh, between the two. Uh, mm -hmm. I feel like Italy is much more open uh, yeah. when it comes to any of that. So yeah, it's definitely something I, I'm considering, yeah. Um, I, have a oh, I have a technical question for you. Um, what budget do you see this movie, in your uh, mind, the ideal budget? The ideal budget? Yeah. Um, well, we have our dream budget, which is like 800,000, uh, okay. and what we're trying to get, which is 250,000. Uh, we believe we can do this on a small budget. Uh, I actually believe you can do this because that's that's a, a very uh, realistic goal, and, mm -hmm. and that's very important because a lot of times people like they overshoot the mark and then they can't reach it. So yeah. I think you're aiming right. Yeah. Um, you said you're gonna direct it. Yeah, I um, I also wrote it with that in mind. Um, okay, and can we it, talk about your experience before? Yeah. What have you yeah. directed before? Um, so I directed this thesis film that is streaming today. Mm -hmm. uh, I directed this proof of concept, 
And uh, yeah, this is my. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I also <laughs> forget, sorry. <laughs> um, I have a production company and we're doing um, music videos and uh, we're trying to get brand and content going. But yeah. Awesome. This is good. Yeah. R remind us again in the setting, the spring break, because I'm curious how you might utilize this space. Yeah. Uh, so, of course, um, it's a very like interesting. Because uh, basically this is like a spy retreat in upstate New York, and it's a very it's a house that is turned into like a, like a, a fancy not um, like Airbnb kind of. Mm -hmm. um, so it it's a it's a layout that is hard to find because there's like guest rooms and then a kitchen and then all of this. So it would be great to use a studio to like actually uh, take like have the control over the space uh, that we're trying to portray. So, Marina, knowing that <clears throat> you're giving the studio time, um, and for everybody in here, it, w just to know, when she's donating studio time, that means she's losing money on a bigger project that could come in, mm -hmm. right? So she's not only donating, but she's also losing. So if something like this, I don't know, what, is this something you would want to potentially entertain? Is this a project that piques your interest? Um, yeah, I think I would have to learn a little bit more about it, but mm -hmm. it sounds interesting and funny. I like Thank funny you. movies. Um, I like the mother-daughter relationship because those can be strange. I can relate to that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's very intriguing. Thank you. Thank uh, you. One thing I just want to bring up was pitch mechanics for everybody in the room. So, and I'm sorry, <coughs> producer's name again? Aspen. Aspen. So you have a very clear way of beating out what you're pitching, which is very good, but I would just suggest rehearsing that. And so read me something on your phone right now. Give, give me like four lines that you said. Okay. Um, this is our timeline. Of course, it's flexible, but ideally, we would love to film during the summer, and I and it would only be a 15 working day shoot, so relatively small and quick. And then what about the line about, uh, there was like a personal statement at the end, why this was relevant? Oh, yeah. Um, as hopeful trailblazers, even just as partial funding will make us so much more closer to our goal of transforming this genre, we want this film to provide a new kind of representation not seen before in tackling the loser virginity film where late- That's viewers... important. Bring that up to the top of the pitch. Okay. We want this film to connect with a whole new uh, generation of females mm -hmm. out there who might be dealing with, you know, you just kind of encapsulate it. I want to see some passion behind mm -hmm. what you guys are talking about. And it is important, you know, the sex positive conversations are important. And I keep thinking back to that Shiva Baby film. I don't, if you guys haven't seen it, it's a great film. Um, yeah. it's, it's kind of a similar comp. So just make sure you're bringing those personal statements to the top. Make sure you're telling us up at the top why you, why now. Well, my mom's like this. This story was inspired by my mother. Mm -hmm. That draws us in because that means you have a stake in what you're writing. Mm -hmm. So we didn't really know that until the end. Yeah. So just pitch mechanics wise, yeah. bring all that stuff up to the top, set the mm -hmm. table, then get into the story. Yeah, did you notice when you said that the, how engaged the entire yeah. audience was? And, and he said you should have led with that. I look at pitching the way I look at auditioning. Mm -hmm. you, just, you, just have, you just have a second. Most yeah. of the time you walk in the room and they know you're going to get the job or not. And it, yeah. For me, it's the, op, the, the latter. Um, <laughs> but I'm like, oh, this fucking guy again. But the, when you make it personal, we're immediately more, in, you know, more engaged instead mm -hmm. of just hearing a story. So yeah, w when it's about you, bring that to the front. I mean, just just make it as specific about that as possible. You mm -hmm. you live this. It's inspired by mm -hmm. your Italian mother. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, I'm going to properly script this name. I'm so sorry. Ba Anna. B A Why did Why did it say Ba? B A? B A. B -A. Okay. I know B A. <laughs> B A has been around a while. <laughs> We're going to have to talk about hey. Tanner's handwriting. <laughs> ba Anna. All right, B.A., we're going a little long on the first two. That was my fault. Uh, so I'm on the clock. You're in the hot seat. <laughs> Hello. Hello, my name is B.A. Welcome to Mammoth Lakes. I live here. The name of my feature ski comedy is About Time. The theme is Be Your Own Hero. A haunted, skiaholic male junior college professor, falsely accused of murder and avoiding being murdered, must lead his, student, his 10 students on a two-week backcountry ski expedition. About time takes place in Double Tusk, at the bowling alley, at the junior college morgue, 
in the backcountry and at the ski resort. The opening steam is in late April, up this way, about five miles from here in the John Muir Wilderness at the Junior College Backcountry Hunt Hut. An impulsive, excuse me, an impulsive pyromaniac in his 40s to celebrate receiving financial aid from the junior college, steals a snowmobile from town, drives up to the hut, and wires it with dynamite. <laughs> the pyromaniac sees his professor skiing towards the hut. He quickly connects the wire fuse to the detonation plunger, not noticing that the wire wraps around his finger or noticing a 22-year-old skier, a 22-year-old female skier skiing towards the hut. The pyromaniac plunges the plunger, it rips his finger off, it goes under the hut, kaboom, the hut explodes. The female skier and the severed finger go into the river. The professor launches into the river, crashes into the female skier, she sinks and disappears. The next scene is 12 days later. The professor and his students are traversing the San Joaquin Ridge to graduation at the ski resort. The professor has the pyromaniac's severed middle finger in a rubber chicken on his backpack. Throughout the trip, the pyromaniac is trying to casually kill the professor, but with only two days left of the expedition and the ski resort in sight, it's time for murder. The pyromaniac puts dynamite under the professor's tent. Unfortunately for the pyromaniac, 10 public safety officers and the physical education dean show up on snowmobiles in camp. The dean, wielding a marmot and a bloody chainsaw, accuses <laughs> and charges the professor with murder and declares the expedition terminated. The students, the 10 students, pelt the dean with snowballs, ski out of camp, ski into the forest, and disappear. The professor skis the opposite way of his students, leading public safety on a wild chase through the forest in the ski resort. By the time the professor skis into his hangout, the bowling alley here in town, in Double Tusk, rather. He learns that skiing is illegal, the dean is going to use a helicopter to evacuate his students, and there is a cash bounty out for his capture. Uh, throughout Acts 2 and 3, the story unfolds with antics in action. The professor attacks the murderer, scrambles to save his students, and skis to stay alive. The pyromaniac shoots the professor multiple times with a flare gun, attaches lit dynamite to the professor's skis, and with the help of the dean, locks the professor in the morgue and sets him on fire. The students, left on their own, believing that their professor has been murdered, uh, get, flung, get violently flung out of a helicopter. Um, they encounter a blizzard that puts their survival skills to the test, and this is all before being buried in an avalanche on graduation day. That's what it's about, and it's about time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Is this a serious movie or a comedy? Comedy. Okay. <laughs> sure. uh, Big time comedy. <laughs> you have seven days in a sound stage. Is it claymation? No. No? Okay. No. okay. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, I don't know if the seven days in the soundstage help your backcountry skiing. But sure. Yeah. I'd probably uh, make a promo for the movie. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what is the tone of the movie? Would you say like Hangover or like? Uh, hangover, kind of Blues Brothers, just fun, rollicking fun, just action happening all the time, character arcs. Yeah. And you are writing it. You're planning to direct it. I'm or, the or writer. It, and you have a director attached. What's that? You have a director attached, or not yet? Not yet. No. Nope. Okay. I have a question about the, the why again, just setting up the world, because, you know, ski, comedy, uh, Hot Tub Time Machine, I love that film, it's hilarious. Um, can you give us the log line one more time and just kind of see if you can encapsulate it? Not all of it. Not all of it? <laughs> <laughs> just just, the, just one line. Um, yeah, a haunted skiaholic male junior college professor falsely accused of murder and avoiding being murdered must lead his 10 students on a two-week backcountry ski expedition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's where it broke for me is the, if he's wanted for murder, where does the ski expedition come in? Like that was the connective tissue I think I wasn't tracking okay. um, because I was looking for the why. Like it sounds funny, it sounds like you got big set pieces yep. and we're gonna see, we're gonna have some laughs, we're gonna have some explosions, but I didn't get a sense of the main character's uh, rootability 
why do I want to root for him? Why do I want to follow him? Why do I want to spend an hour and a half with him? You know? Sure. Um, sure. So I think a little bit more of that in the pitch would help me a little okay. bit. Because the yeah. dean also has public safety kidnap one of his students. And that's what he gets charged with murder for. Got it. Okay. Okay. Did you write this already? I did. 96% finished. <laughs> Where, where'd you get the idea? Uh, I taught at colleges. I taught at different colleges, yeah. junior colleges, for over 20 years, backcountry skiing, and obviously moved here for the skiing. So, Honestly, man, that should be part of your pitch, too. Sure. Yeah. Instead of just... I mean, it's, it's fantastic. It's out there. I mean, it's like uh, it, immediately I started thinking, you remember Hot Dog? Yep. Yeah. That, that's kind of like the tone that I was thinking of. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this has more backcountry elements involved, too. Yeah, and it seems like, you know, that we go in cycles on things, probably not going to be a lot of pirate. Like, when you said, I hope this, there's no pirate pitches, I was like, I'm waiting for people to get up and walk out. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we haven't, had, we haven't had a funny ski comedy in a while. Maybe Correct. It, maybe it's time for it. Absolutely. Um, what, what do you guys think as far, like, it's almost like you, you gave us every beat by beat of your script. I, I don't know if that's necessary so much in a, in a pitch. What's the page count running at right now? 88. Oh. And you're going to add four more percent. So you'll be at 91. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll top out at 91. Yeah. <laughs> three, three pages. Yeah. No, but I think, look, that, that's a good point, Jeff. Yeah, we don't need to hear beat for beat for beat. It's like <clears throat> act one, this, maybe an act two, this, maybe an act three. It wraps up with a big conclusion. Okay. You, can, can, you can consolidate for sure okay. and just give us the broad strokes because uh, we want to we get a sense of your big idea, right? So when you get into the minutia, that's where it's getting a little hard to track the story, right? Yeah, I felt like you were getting into the end of Act 3 when he skied into the bowling alley. Mm. And then it was, and then Act 2 and 3. Um, so yeah, I would, okay. Yeah. It, is, it is hard. You know it, obviously. It's in your head, clearly. It is, when you're, when you're getting into so much minutia, it's, it is hard to track it for people to listen to. Sure. Okay. Um, I want to read it. Cool. Awesome. I, I, I want to be in it. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> There you Sorry. go. So hurry up. <laughs> That's a win. Anybody else got any feedback for BA? Uh, in your mind, uh, what's the ideal distributor? Is it a streamer? Is it goes to theaters? What, what, what do you That's see? A, good question. a streamer. A streamer. Yeah. So I'm um, on the couch at home. I'm watching this thing and mm -hmm. having fun. I mean, I'd like to have it on the big screen, too. I think it's going to be a big action movie, obviously. So um, I'm open. And, and what are you doing about... Pursuing a director and pursuing, I mean, what else are you, are you, are you trying? Yeah, this is, is this, is this the first time you pitched it? Uh, I pitched it two years ago. Okay. But I've completely revamped. He, he, you pitched it here two years ago? Mm-hmm. Oh, I've it. completely revamped the script, so. Any directors in the room? That, yeah. yeah. Oh, you got one back there? All right, man, thank you so much. All right, thank Thanks, you. Dude. That was great. Um, Julia. There she is. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm Julia Barnett. So uh, for the last 25 years, I've worked with a charity in East Africa, uh, many times living in both Kenya and Uganda. And many of the children I worked with back in the mid-90s went on to go back into their communities and make a difference. And they are the inspiration for my family TV show, Slum Angel. Um, so setting a family TV show in a Ugandan urban community really opens up this rarely experienced window into a beautiful community of different tribes and languages, religions. Um, there's an old Indian influence that's there as well as this kind of new Chinese influence that's coming in. So, um, you know, while many of our family TV shows are ethnically diverse, they are not economically diverse, though much of the world exists in poverty. So, this show is about Angel. She's an 11-year-old girl who lives in a Ugandan slum, and after her mother dies, she inherits these supernatural powers that when she touches someone, she can see into their past and their memories. And she really struggles to understand why this is happening to her, and that's when she meets her father for the first time, who is an angel, a real angel, which makes her half human, half angel. 
Now her very best friend in the whole world is Abdul. He's this quick-witted Muslim street boy who loves to find the joy and humor in life. He's always making jokes about American TV shows. And the two of them decide to set up Angel and Abdul's detective agency as a way to like, feed themselves, care for their family, and also help their community. So after solving their very first mystery of their neighbor's missing chickens, they decide to um, take some of their earnings and splurge on their favorite restaurant, which is called Fang Fang. It's actually the oldest Chinese restaurant still today in Kampala. And they go there and they meet their friend Jake, who is a Chinese teenager, and his dad owns Fang Fang, and he also owns the land that they live on. And Jake has some bad news for them. There, his dad has plans to demolish their kind of makeshift community and build a mall over it. So they're thrust into solving a new problem. And the two of them, in the end, they discover that Mr. Chan is being blackmailed into building over this community. And they end up saving everyone's homes except for Angel's. Angel's gets destroyed in their, in their um, detective agency. Mr. Chan feels so much remorse, he ends up turning both himself and the blackmailers into the authorities. And he gives Angel a new home in a kind of new posh community in Kampala. And this causes a huge rift between Angel and Abdul because she's not there anymore. They're not doing the, the um, agency. And he feels kind of rejected by her. And to make things worse, Angel is spending a lot more time with her angel father, Malaika. And that was okay at first, because when they were solving their mysteries, Malaika would give them hints and clues along the way. So that didn't bother Abdul so much, but the real issue he has is that he cannot see Malaika. In fact, no one can see Malaika. So is he just a figment of Angel's imagination, or is he truly an angel? And that's something that we will answer at the end of the first season, um, where we also will kind of find are there other Nephilim children out there, half angel, half human children. We'll find that out at the end of the first season. But in this pilot episode, Malaika encourages Angel to go back to their community and to check in on Abdul. And when she does, she goes back, she runs into one of her friends, Sarah, whose mom is a UN aid worker, and she says, it, it, Abdul has gone missing. So now Angel feels so terrible thinking that maybe her decision to leave their community caused Abdul to go back to his life on the streets. So she digs through the rubble that was once their home and their agency, and there she finds his little skull cap, and she realizes something more sinister has happened to Abdul. This is the end of the pilot episode. Each of these episodes will have a self-contained mystery, but this pilot episode leads into the second episode where Angel will go and find Abdul in northern Uganda with the um, Liberation Army. He will bring her back, sorry, she will bring him back to their community where she'll commit fully to Angel and Abdul's detective agency and helping in their community. So I was able uh, in 2019, right before the pandemic, to go to Uganda and I shot a proof of concept with all Ugandan cast and crew. Some of the kids weren't even really actors, but they brought so much authenticity to the piece. And one of the things that was most meaningful to me is that one of the kids that I worked with, Annette Kabuye, in 1995, she was the producer on this project. So it's really these relationships that are fueling my passion to get the story out and show a better picture of children from vulnerable environments around the world. So. Great. <laughs> That was a tight five minutes, right on the button. Thank you. Good job. Um, <laughs> who wants to kick us off? I'll, I'll go. Okay. You're obviously very passionate about uh, yeah. this entire subject, and it seems like Africa is a very dear place to you, which is really nice. Uh, my question to you, is this going to be in English, or is it going to be more authentic, like in the native language? That's a really good question. Yes, I think that it'll be in English, but we will have subtitles for some of the characters, and that's kind of how the proof of concept is. Um, and also, I mean, depending on if it's on a stream or where it's shown, it can be obviously dubbed, yeah. And do you know of any examples of other TV shows that are similar to this, or things that you can point out and say it's kind of like this, or maybe like that? Yeah, you know, there's not a lot of shows kind of set in this environment, and. Um, I actually had a development deal with this show in 2020 with a small network. Um, we were looking for the right showrunner and it kind of fell apart. But then Sweet Tooth came out 
And mm -hmm. I feel like it's a very similar tone to Sweet Tooth. And even though that's kind of futuristic, there's all those kind of elements to it that are similar. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what, what's your goal? Or do you want to just sell it as the writer creator? Do you want to, what's your aspirations? With it? So I did write the pilot and of course I've brought, built out the show, but I need to find the right showrunner, uh, African American or African showrunner for sure. And then, you know, I'd want to be producing it and be one of the writers on it. I, I've also kind of taken this idea of, I don't know if you're familiar with the Nephilim, but that's their half angel, half human and um, built out like a whole world where there are four other Nephilim children that have four different stories that are very unique and different and come together. So there's a much larger world that uh, that could be there, mm -hmm. which I realize that this show probably isn't right to shoot at Marina Studios, but I have these other stories that could be right that could help kind of sell the, the, whole, the whole idea because it's kind of a big picture idea. Question for some of the people on the panel, I guess. The, the the hook for me was really cool, like very simple. Kids all over the world are half angel, half human. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm in. Tell me more. The thing that kind of lost me a little bit was Uganda. Why are we there? And if I'm thinking like a network exec, they're probably thinking, well, American audiences don't really care about people overseas, unfortunately. You know, they care <laughs> about people here. There's probably a lot of social socioeconomic disparity we can highlight here. Uh, can yeah. it be a somebody from a lower income community in Chicago or, yeah. you know, Louisiana. So I don't know, what'd you guys think about, about that? Yeah, I, I was uh, a little bit confused at the start because you're describing it as a family drama and I'm waiting to hear a story about a family in Africa, right? It, it makes me think immediately, like something like Mosquito Coast. It's like, why did this family go here? And then you're focusing on Angel. Your hook comes later with the Nephilim and it suddenly mm. it's a fantasy show, which I didn't know yeah. from the top. Now, when you go to pitch, you know, the, any executive is going to have a primer from an agent saying, like, Correct. this is what the show's about and this is where it's set. But we didn't have any of that. So I was trying to catch up as you were pitching. The setting of, you know, the townships in Africa mm -hmm. is interesting. I've shot in Cape Town. I've been to Kailicha. Like, that's a fascinating arena. It, I don't see how it's quite gelling with the Nephilim unless you're going to go and and kind of tie it into the witchcraft that exists in Africa, mm. right? I didn't see that thread there. No, I think you know. I don't think the witchcraft is there. It's more, I mean, the Nephilim are, it's a, it's a belief that maybe they existed many years ago, yeah. half angel, half human. Um, so the TV show is separate, but I have built out the world. So the, the, the four different settings are Uganda, Texas, Indiana, and India. Um, so, you know, we could, and I could go on about the Tomorrow Children, what I'm, that's a whole nother pitch, though. Yeah, because so. it also sounds like you have a full season, which is searching for a missing kid who's been taken by the Liberation Army, and right? That's, that's a just, fascinating world of child soldiers. Yes. So you have a lot of interesting arenas here, but they're just mm -hmm. not congealing to me into, like, a quite a coherent story, you know what I mean? Mm. So I think you have to kind of pick and choose where you want to spend your time and what, and what you want to lead with in your pitch, yeah. you know? Like, well, there's been a lot of shows out there with missing children, missing being one of them, from the, which the English show, it's terrific, but um, what then is your season two? And you're also focusing on a detective agency, so, so I've got, I'm the trying whole, to understand. Yeah, like, so the, he's only missing for one episode. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, so the whole season is basically Angel and Abdul in their community solving mysteries and helping people. Right, because when yeah. you pitch me a pilot that the guy goes missing in the end. He does, and but by the second. It sets up like the yeah. season's about the search for this kid, you know, so. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, just could, to, I can change that, yeah. Well, it, it just, you know, which story do you want to tell, I guess, is what I'm asking, because you have a lot of different areas here. And if you're going to lead with, if the Nephilim children, which is interesting, I've never really heard that before, you know, I would, I I would lead and dig into that more okay. and explore how that show is about these children, you know? Yeah, because the other elements of the Ugandan townships felt like a hat on a hat. Like, oh, is that the hook I'm, I'm carrying because of the trials and tribulations they're going through. So I, I agree with you. That's why I kind of was creating a connection to mm -hmm. uh, the spirituality that exists in Africa that can help explicate that, you know, to give a reason for like why she might be there and why we're exploring these children, you know. So the, the four leads of the show are Angel and Abdul, Sarah, who's white, and then Jake, who's Chinese. And so the four of them, there just wasn't enough time for me to get into all of that, but the four yeah. of them, you know, I touched on it, are really, and I think that there isn't, I think that there's interest, in, I would, my kids would love to watch a show like that with different um, characters. It just happens to be set in the Ugandan slum, yeah. Yeah. 
Cool. I thought that hook was really strong, though. It's, it's a really Thank strong you. hook, for sure. Anybody else? Yeah, I was just curious. Tonally, you know, you've got kind of the lighter, sweeter kids, you know, doing the detective agency. Um, but then they're also seeing some really darker, heavier issues. So I was just curious, do you see that being more the lighter, sweeter version, mm -hmm. uh, or are you going to go down into that darkness and really explore? I think it depends on the network that's interested in it. When we were originally developing it for Disney, we really kind of made it a lot um, brighter. And But I do think that, you know, I don't want it to be dark. I don't know if you saw the Ladies Detective Agency, if any of you ever saw that, but everyone's in bright colors, you know, there's, but they're still, they still want to be dealing with issues that they're dealing with in their community while still, um, it, I don't want it to be dark, I don't want it to be poverty porn, that's the whole point, you know, I want, I want people to see the beauty and the dignity and the unlimited potential in these communities. Cool. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, do we have Dakota? We'll talk later. Hi, I'm Dakota. Oh, Jesus yeah. Christ. I forget I'm 6'3 sometimes. Uh, I'm Dakota. I'm the screenwriter. You can adjust that mic if you want to. Sure, yeah. I'm Dakota. I'm the screenwriter for the film Anchorage um, and one of the leads of the film Anchorage. I'm also in the short film Bona Tavada, which is in the 130 block. If you guys want to run over there afterwards. Um, so I'm here to pitch you a feel good family number that starts with a child abduction. So let's just go there. Okay, so this is every, let's go there. It's every parent's nightmare, right? You, let's start with one kid with his friends on the playground. Let's call him Jesus. He's the only son, right? Also, that's the name of the picture, only son. So Jesus is alone on the playground with his friends. Little fucking pickup truck comes pulling up, and the guy comes out of the car, and it's kind of like whistling and motioning him over. And it's literally every parent's nightmare. The kid gets in the car with this guy, leaves all his friends at the junior high and takes off. Now we cut to that child's mother. She's at the precinct, right? She's talking to the cops and everything. She's trying to figure out like, what, what can I do? How can I help? What could I, you know, trying to piece it all together. It's not until later when they bring in one of the kids who was at the playground who describes the car. It's like green pickup truck. It's my fucking ex. It's Michael, it's his, it's his father. That was the guy in the fucking pickup truck, right? But it's like, he was, he's supposed to still be locked up, right? Would he get out on good behavior? This guy went away from methamphetamine possession, unregistered firearm, you know, he stole a fucking car. Like, I, we moved back to my hometown, we changed back to my maiden name. Like, how could he find us? But as soon as she figures that out, now she's on a warpath to go get the kid, whether or not the cops are gonna help her. So now we got Kramer versus Kramer meets Hearts of Darkness, right? We're going up the fucking river, but like we're having this like father son uh, coming to age story at the same time where it's like mother on the fucking warpath. I'm getting my fucking kid back. You know what I mean? Um, so how does it end? Great question. So if you'll all turn to page 329 in the Holy Bible, which has been provided to us by the Walk and Roll or what is the name of this place? But if you all turn there, there's a story of King Solomon is presented the baby. How are we going to deal with this? Well. Page 329. Bring me a sword, he says, and we'll split the child. So it's all going to come up to this moment where the guy's been arrested, they've apprehended him, and the wife's there too, and it's like, well, let's let the kid decide. Who does he want to go with? And that's only son. That's the pitch, yeah. Also, also just like, if you, if you don't mind, if I just have a couple extra seconds, will you just repeat after me? Ready? Deo, miserio. Sorry, I always wanted to do that. Sorry. Uh, well, you certainly got passion in your pitch. Thank you. Thank you. you yeah. uh, who wants to jump in? Is it just me, or you said it's feel good drama in the beginning? Well, you know, like, you know, it feels Am I crazy. Good. It feels good I feel at the end. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. Like, the thing is, it's gonna be. I, I, I like making pictures where like you, you provide questions and then you guys go home after watching it and you get to argue about it. Should he have gone with the kid? Was it a feel good movie? Why, why did we, like, what was this whole thing about, right? So, so. I, I would say don't, don't lead with that because it's confusing. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it feels like something more dark than yeah, yeah. feel good. 
It's more of a cathartic picture, okay. you know, not okay. feel good, yeah. No, so when you said that and you started preaching, I was like, it starts with a yeah, child. When does it start I'll feeling think. good? Yeah. Yes, yeah, <laughs> basically. Totally. Would you say this is a tale of redemption for the dad or? Yeah, and uh, for the mother too, and for the, the kid himself. I mean, the, to me, I, I like those like Miyazaki, Kurosawa movies. No good guys, no bad guys, okay? Here's people, let's hang out with them. So the dad is trying to reunite with his son, have a relationship they never had before. The, the mother is trying to assert her, you know, like, this is my kid, that's my fucking kid, you know? And the kid himself is like caught in the middle, torn between, you know, two, two different warring companies or whatever. Mm -hmm. Is the dad a legit bad guy, or is he... Yeah, he's a deadbeat. I'm not looking at you when I'm saying this, no. The, yeah, he's a deadbeat. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think, I think he's just like a fucked up kid, man. I think he was a fucked up kid. I think he has that arrested development thing where he never really fucking grew up, totally. And he's like, well, what can I do? You know what? I'm gonna go pick up my kid and take him to meet grandma for the first time, right? He's never met the grandmother before, so. Are we fearing for the kids? Safety. In the first 15 minutes, fuck yes you are. Fuck yes you are. It starts in that, I want tension to be another character in the fucking car, you know what I mean? Like, so you start and you, as an outsider, with no dramatic irony to it, you don't know who is this guy to this kid. It's just like every parent's nightmare. Kid got in the fucking car with the guy. So for the first 15, it ain't fun, you know? And you're tracking with the kid in the car and is he scared? Like, you know. Well, that's the thing, like how can we, how can we play it colorfully? You know, where it's like, like, what's the nuance? What's the in-between? You know what I mean? Like a game of inches kind of thing. But yeah, so you're rooting for the kid, you're rooting for the dad, you're rooting for the mom, and it kind of becomes parallel stories where it's like, you're following this coming of age thing, but you're also following her on a war path. And all roads lead to El Dorado, right? This shit is gonna fucking hit, you know? Like, <clears throat> it's gonna be a showdown. Uh, when you say, yeah, I'm, I'm rooting for the dad, the what part I'm rooting for him? If he's kidnapping the kid, and then, you know, we don't know how the kid feels, and it just feels like just a kidnap. Um, it's like, well, does anyone have parents? Do any of you? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's that thing, you know, it's that thing of like, I don't know. I come from a broken home. I come from uh, family uh, addiction and abuse and stuff, and I just can't hate anybody, though. Even if I don't like the person, I don't talk to him anymore, I can't hate him, you know what I mean? So I think the real beautiful colors come out from those complexities. Like, do I like the dad? I don't fucking know. 90 pages in, I still don't know if I like the fucking dad, you know, like, so. And I, if I could give you any advice on encapsulating the top, it's like, yeah. if I'm distilling everything you just said, it's, um, this is a modern drama that focuses on young love and all the uh, missteps, pains, and trials that two young parents have to fight. And stuck in the middle is the child. And we see the film through the child's eyes. And, get to see him see his parents grow up, and that's kind of what I'm distilling from it. Absolutely. And it feels like, what's the, what's the movie with, um, it's just big on Netflix, Love Story? Is that? Is oh, it? Marriage Story? Marriage Story. Oh, like, yeah. Something like that. It was, like, just, it was just very raw. It yeah. was very yeah. just yeah, real yeah, yeah, yeah. and raw, and it focused on the nuances. It, it could be boring in anybody else's hands, but because that writer was that writer, and that director was that director, that, yeah. you know, it, it was, it was, Passionate, it was amazing. It was like taking a microscope and examining and amplifying these little moments of our everyday lives that we think are mundane and just, just you know, really and propping it up. You're a lawyer, like you're on the fucking wall watching this shit. Yeah. Like, I can't believe I'm watching this. Fucking... That's the yeah. kind of shit I like, yeah. I yeah, know. so I think, you know, if you can round out the top a little bit, maybe Hell that yeah. might help. So, anybody Appreciate else? Appreciate you. Also, if you guys are available Sunday at 2.30, Anchorage is playing over at the Minaret Theater, so right we'd love to see you. <laughs> All right, Robert. Robert Sweeting. Hi, how is everybody today? Pretty good. Uh, so my name is Robert Sweeting. Uh, I'm a director. I direct commercials. This is actually going to be my first pitch that is not commercial based. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Marina because my family has a large background in uh, Mattapan, Massachusetts, and I know that you guys are on Victory Road in, uh, in Quincy, so I find that amazing that you're bringing uh, production there. So, thank nice. you. Thank you, you guys. Appreciate it. 
Uh, I wanted to kind of give a background. My movie's name is uh, Guns Down. It is a 20 minute short that I'm working on with a producer of mine. Uh, the issue is, is that uh, we have a problem nationwide. Specifically, I'm from New Jersey, and uh, there's an issue with asset forfeiture where police departments will essentially fund a portion of uh, will a, a portion of their salaries, uh, a portion of equipment, anything else, to fund police departments and. What you can actually do is that you don't even need to prove that there's a crime committed. You can essentially seize money and it's incumbent upon you to actually prove that that money was actually yours. And this is what our film addresses. Uh, it is about a veteran police officer who takes matters into his own hands to secure money necessary for his wife's life-saving treatment. The story follows four people, Elijah, Quentin, Gil and Sandra. Gil and Sandra are local business owners who own a convenience store, and they own multiple vending machines around the city. Uh, Elijah is turned down from his insurance. He doesn't have enough money to be able to afford the life saving treatment. And in 2015, this is a personal story for me, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer, so it really changed the trajectory of where you live, uh, just being faced with mountains of debt and knowing that uh, really limits your choices and of career and everything else. And we follow Elijah where he is, he recruits his partner, uh, Quentin, who is an Afghan war veteran uh, to help him and who he is the only one who fully understands and is emotionally vulnerable with him, where they devise a plan to seize funds from a local car, car theft ring and through asset forfeiture. And the plan works. It is the first time that he can actually breathe in a long time. Uh, he raises the $100,000 and what he doesn't realize is that he's being watched this entire time. So another person who is higher ranking than him comes and essentially seizes the money from him and they are back at square one. As a last resort, he attempts to seize a payroll from Gil and Sandra, uh, the business owners. Since they own vending machines, he knows that they have uh, a lot of cash on hand. Uh, when the store owner refuses to cooperate because of his own financial burden, uh, our main character is desperately pulls a weapon on uh, Gil. No longer t ten standing by and seeing harm uh, inflicted on people, uh, Quentin is now faced with a choice. Is he going to back up this person who he has this great emotional connection with, knows every single detail of the, the struggles that he's going in with his life, or essentially help the stranger who he has no connection to? And what ends up happening is that, uh, unfortunately, he ends up fatally shooting this mentor and big brother figure to save this person's life. Um, so there's four locations that we're gonna be shooting in, uh, which is a store, a office, and two other locations. But I think that production value-wise, it would really raise it and take the story seriously, even though it's 20 minutes. I wanna give it as much resources as humanly possible. And again, this is my first pitch, so I'm fully, I definitely wanna know your feedback. Thank you. Great. Thank you. You said this is a feature film? This is not a feature film. This is it's a 20-minute short. Film, short. Right? This is just the pitch for the short. Correct. Got it, got it, got it. Um, cool. Who wants to jump in? I think just in general, as an advice, like uh, producers and financiers, uh, they shy away from shorts most of the time because it's very hard to recoup the money. Absolutely. Uh, so I think that you have to, um, when you are pitching a short film, you have to also show them 
what is the, lang the, 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 the full feature version of this movie because then I can be like, you know what, I can spend this money or invest this money and then I can kind of get a, a proof of concept for my the feature that I want to do. But just if you, if you, you can't even see where it's going, then it's going to be very hard for me to invest money. Got it, I understand. I guess, yeah, my question is, can it live as a feature, to, to Maurice's point? Uh, it can live as a feature. Right now, I wanted it to be a self-contained 20-minute short film, so that is uh, from beginning to end, understand the concept within a short period of time, because I feel like if you can't explain it in 20 minutes, you can really can't explain it over an hour and a half. Yeah. And but the in terms of the concept, though, is are you trying to draw attention to asset for, for, for Correct. feature? Okay. Correct. Because... Uh, I mean, it's an interesting little loophole, but I think just uh, listening to a story, I want to hear the story first, and I think what you're missing is you have a very sympathetic character, right? A veteran cop who uh, is trying to get money for his sick wife? Correct. Right. So I, so I feel like you want to lead with this story and then get into the issue of asset forfeiture. He's exploiting a loophole in a legal system that not a lot of us know, but, you know, you've you got to entertain us first before you get into the issue. So I would like focus more on your characters to tell the story and then highlight how he's able, you know, to, to break the law here. And, or is it breaking the law, you know? Uh, he is breaking the law. As the forfeiture is used to fund police departments, it's not used to... Yeah, and I honestly, I wasn't, I wasn't totally clear on what the asset for, you know, what is the loophole? Like, how is it done, so... He's exploiting a loophole that is, it's supposed to go to police departments, but he's just taking it for himself to use. Right, I'm still not there. Like, you have a guy who has, uh, who does he rob first? Uh, there's a local car theft ring that he seizes money from. So he essentially pulls them over. They have cash in the car. He just he takes, takes their cash. It. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. You know, for me, it was uh, the big, uh, big ideas here. I was writing down was like it's it's a story of a. It's very John Q-esque in the broken medical system. Like, this guy can't get his wife the treatment she needs, right? So it's a story of a broken medical system. It's a story of police corruption. And it's good people doing bad things for good reasons. You know, that's why breaking Correct. Bad, that's the know. overall point of the film. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, simplifying those beats up top usually helps us set the table, let us know what, where, what world we're living in. And I think if you're going to live in this short film world, I like the idea of this, like, a, like the tension and the ticking clock element of this guy worrying if he's going to get caught, moving money around, like... The theft of it all is probably a high tension point for him just within the department, getting caught by his buddies who probably take a little off the top. The police corruption angle for me, mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's pretty topical and it's pretty interesting because it's, it's police corruption. We all know it's there, but it's police corruption for a good reason in this case. So he's got to maybe escape his buddies who are like, hey, we're supposed to take that money and you know buy our yachts or pay our captains, whatever they do. Yeah, correct. It's usually used for that, but in yeah. this case, I thought it would be a, an empathetic reason. Yeah. I don't know, just living in that tension-filled world of like, am I going to get caught if I do this? I don't know. That's that 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 high tension world for me felt felt like the right play for sure. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yeah, I'd just say if uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, if you're pitching to have somebody finance your short, I think they're looking at you like, oh, this is an investment in this person. We're getting in on the ground floor of this career so that we can then step up and go into something bigger. So. I'd say maybe speak a little bit more to your background and why you would be the guy to get into here. Investment. Yeah, of course. So uh, I'm a brand content commercial director. I have done stuff for Google, L'Oreal. My background is mostly in beauty tech uh, commercials. Uh, and what I wanted to do was use that same skill set to actually tell a compelling story because oftentimes telling brand content stories, you can only do that for so long before it's not as fulfilling as, uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that, not as fulfilling as you once thought it would be. Yeah, uh, I'd, lead, I'd lead with that, work with your background, and then the story, and less about, in the beginning of your pitch, was kind of explaining what the, the asset forfeiture, I was kind of getting confused where you're going. Once you started in, I, I think I would just move those around in your pitch. It's about you, it's personal, here's, here's what the story's based on. And then you can talk, like the, the, the minutia that you gave in the very beginning, I feel like could comes in the question and answer afterwards a little bit. Great, I'll definitely move that up. Cool. Make sure you that they agree with that though, because uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. they're the that was great advice. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? No. Okay. Thank you so much. Good job. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Josh. We have Josh in the house. 
Check my text. You say, look at your phone. <laughs> Yeah, not quite that tall. So, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, first off, my name is Josh Marble. I am a director, a writer, and an actor. And this morning, I wanted to actually it's almost afternoon, uh, but still morning. I wanted to share with you a project that is entitled CRT South Creek. Um, CRT South Creek. It is a ten-episode social justice action drama that delves into the ideas of the sociology and the psychology behind domestic terrorism in, in this country. Uh, the show's in the same vein as shows like Jack Ryan, Chernobyl, Hannibal, and The First Purge, and it addresses topics such as raci racism, prejudices, bullying, political corruption, and others, and it's all done in a very high-octane action way, but deeply rooted in character-driven story. Honestly, the action is great, but it doesn't matter unless we have the relationships that really bring the story to life. Um, the official logline is dispatched to their first domestic terrorist attack. A team of three specialists must work to infiltrate the mind of an attacker who threatens the students and staff of a small town school and who claims that this attack is merely the start of a devastating cleanse. Honestly, like I was talking about this with my fiance last night. I was like, in short, the premise of the show is what if the South tried to rise again and start another civil war? Um, the season one storyline, as part of that, the location takes place in Georgia. The main characters, the three main characters, the first one is Isabella Cortez. She is a former army ranger who was honorably discharged after suffering severe injury and who also struggles because of the injury with PTSD, but she wants to prove that she can still be a viable asset in a fight against terrorism. And also on a personal note to her, her father died serving and that's where she has, she feels like she still has that connection. She doesn't want to lose that connection by being asked to step back from being in active service. Uh, Carter Jones is a former border patrol agent who leaves border patrol after his fiance was killed during a drug bus mission gone wrong that he tried to call off. He has a big problem with authority because he feels like he knew how to prevent this loss of life and other people didn't listen to him. And then Khalil, uh, Khalil Nahas, he escaped from war-torn uh, war -torn countries in the middle, uh, excuse me, a war-torn town in the Middle East and he's devoted his entire life to fighting terrorism because it actually cost him his mother and uh, sisters in a bombing that happened over there. The reason this show matters to me is First off, I used to live in Colorado. I lived down the street from Columbine, and that impacted me at a very young age. And I've seen how progressive that it's become commonplace to hear the, another shooting, another attack, another this, that, and the other that's happening. And honestly, I feel like we need to, I, I want to do more to make that stop. Also, like, I've seen friends deal with extreme racism. My fiance is Indian and I've literally seen an entire restaurant in other parts of this country go dead silent when I walked in with her. My brother is, was a police officer who almost lost his life in several, several incidents, not just one because of the challenges that they go through. Um, and my mom was also a principal of a school and there's times she'd call me and say, we're on lockdown right now. And that's not a call anyone ever wants to get. Um, each episode focuses on a particular main character's uh, struggle or supporting character's struggle in the present moment and their past uh, with domestic terrorism and the conditions that shape them and how it impacts the overall season. Oh, excuse me. Each episode, let me, <laughs> let me take that from the top. Um, each episode focuses on a particular main or uh, strong supporting character's struggle both in the present moment or in the past with domestic terrorism and also the conditions that are happening in the moment with the present storyline. Um, but flashbacks do play a big factor in how the situations that people have been through have led up to this moment. Uh, casting has to be diverse, has to represent people from different groups, ethnicities, um, financial statuses, because we want the story to be real, we want it to be visceral and authentic, and I really think that the only way to do that is to be authentic and genuine with the casting of it. The style, dark, gritty, suspenseful, emotional, raw, like the aim is to showcase the events depicted in a genuine and gripping manner. Uh, we want you on the edge of your sheet, but we also, we don't want to shy back from what this is. I feel like that's, it's too often overlooked. It's too often the thing you hear on CNN and then you just go back to your dinner. Like we want it to really get in people's face. It would have a score similar to like what you hear in The Joker or 13 Hours, something that instantly catches you and puts you in, a, in that state of mind. Platform streamers would have to be something that we'd have a little more freedom with rating systems. Um, and forward thinking statement, this show is 10 episodes. It is a full arc line for this season, but their work's not done. Right now, it's outlined for five seasons, and every season covers a different domestic, uh, domestic threat. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Great. Great. Uh, did I miss at the top there uh, the, like, the, the, the group they work with, FBI, CIA? They are a new uh, force. New force. So this is their first mission that they are sent out on. What does CRT stand for? 
crisis response team. What, and so what agency would it be attached to? So it was, it is the development of a new agency, but it is taken. It's not under the banner of Homeland Security. Or it's not under the banner of Homeland Security. It is uh, founded by a former FBI, um, FBI agent who did psycholo psychological analytics. But it's a federal agency? Or yes. is it private? Federal. Federal, yeah, okay. How would you use the studio time? Honestly, there, for me, I think the best way I could use it is it's very hard to do situations like this for in actual schools because you're dealing with a lot of political red tape. So I think having a studio space where we could use that, even if we were just to use it as the ability to shoot that for um, a proof of concept and make a very strong proof of concept would help. Um, I know a lot of schools aren't going to be super happy with us going in and faking this there. So that would be helpful. Do you have a budget yet? We do not have a budget, honestly, just because it started as a short. I was working with the management. They like turned this into a feature, then someone else said turn it into a show. So because it's had so many iterations, we're kind of just working with the storyline right now and letting, you know, letting it evolve. <laughs> so originally it was a short that I wrote. Have, so. have you written the pilot? I have, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, written the pilot, written out a 73-page breakdown of the entire first season storyline, and then a breakdown of the next five seasons. Jay, what does this fall into? Like, not, not crime procedural, but uh, networks are always looking it's for not, It's not a procedural if you're not doing standalone episodes, right? Because you're talking about doing a... So this is a domestic terrorist event that takes place at a school like Columbine. But are you, are you it, looking at a hostage situation for 10 episodes? We're looking at, well, we start with Possibly. that storyline. It starts, it evolves, starts that course. way. It's kind of like how uh, the show Chernobyl, it focused on one event over many episodes. Sure. And you told that story through the flashbacks in the present time. Right. And then season two can be a completely different event. Exactly. With the same, team. same main character, yeah. same strike team. Yeah. You should probably leave with that. I wasn't quite sure if you were going for procedural okay. or, uh, you know, serialized, which it sounds like you've got a fictitious you know, agency. Mm. I think. If you're, if you're going to stick with that, uh, you've got to define like why it exists. That should be part of the story of the pilot, how these people came together. You know? it, because, it is, but thank you for letting me know because yeah. I need to include that. Yeah. Um, and then just be upfront with it. It's, just, you know, it's serialized. Like this, this school hostage situation is going to take place over 10 episodes. Okay. Obviously, we'll know it'll evolve and make you know, yeah. the school, but uh, it's important to know just you know, kind of what you're pitching. Because if it's a procedural, then you're talking about network, you know. Yeah. Not many streamers are into that now. So. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Anybody else? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thanks, Josh. Uh, before we bring up the next pitch, we should all just, we're all here IRL in real life, but we're also streaming live on the metaverse through the Mammoth uh, Media Institute. So I guess we're all NFTs now. Is that what that means? <laughs> so wave at the cameras. We're in the metaverse. Um, let's uh, bring up the next person. I got um, Neil, Neil Watson. Thanks for the pressure. <laughs> right on point. Appreciate the streaming effort. Millions of metaverse humans I know. are watching. Everybody right now. now knows this crazy story. Um, my name is Neil Watson. I'm a writer-director. Uh, my pitch is for a feature film. It's called uh, The Couch. It's <clears throat> actually based on some true facts uh, with uh, my friendship uh, in Orlando that I had years and years ago. Um, the tone of it is dark comedy. It's about how true friendships can actually really last even through like the worst hardships ever. So Alex and Mark are two friends in their mid-20s living in Orlando, Florida in a rundown apartment complex. Alex is shy, smart, he's a responsible guy who's always trying to succeed within the jobs that he works in, but his bosses, his love life, everything is just goes to shit every time. Mark, on the other hand, is a live by the moment, seat of his pants kind of guy. Works at a local strip bar as a bartender. He's a part-time drug dealer for his boss. And so his decision-making skills are a little off, if you can. So Mark decides he wants to throw a party for Alex. So since Alex is now moving in with him and working at the same bar, they don't have any furniture because it's a rundown place. They have one tube TV in the whole living room aside from their beds. So having no money, they decide they're going to go dumpster diving, uh, which in Florida is hazardous at best. Uh, after going through some crazy neighborhoods, chased by hillbillies, dealing with gators, which obviously is Florida, uh, they successfully acquire a bean bag and then an odd-looking couch as well. So the party 
begins, it rages on. During this party, Mark gets a little bit crazy, takes his full drug stash that he has and just throws it out to the party, gives it all away. At the same time, Alex is getting drunk, about to pass out, and he thinks he witnesses a cat walking in and then suddenly being sucked in by the couch. After this, the next day they head to work, they leave their TV on, which is on Yo! MTV Raps because they have absolutely no other channel on there. Uh, Mark at work runs into trouble with his boss since he owes a lot of money now for the drugs that he gave away. Alex, on the other hand, meets Nicole, who's this girl next door, who's a new waitress. Uh, she's very street smart, can handle her, street smart, can handle herself, and the waitressing job that she's doing is actually a means to an end. So Alex and Nicole connect immediately there. Alex and Mark return home exhausted to sit down on the couch and try to rest. As they ponder what their next move is gonna be, they hear Snoop Dogg's voice coming in from underneath them telling them to get the fuck off. The guys jump off of the couch. As they freak out, Snoop Dogg's voice calmly tells them to calm down, begins to tell them the story how he's an alien trapped inside of this couch. <clears throat> Uh, and the reason it hasn't been able to get out is because it is still not strong enough to do so because it hasn't eaten in ages. So within their conversation with the alien, he convinces them that he can actually make their lives better. He can actually help them out in whatever they need. They just have to feed him so he can become stronger. Alex on this is very reluctant. Mark sees this as a very big godsend, so they both agree. Time passes, the guys feed the couch random foods Condition just continues to stay the same, nothing happens. One night, Mark and Alex are home, and one of the bouncers from the strip bar busts in to collect drug money. After he beats down the guys, pulls out a gun on him, and is about to collect, he decides to sit down on the couch. A few tentacles cross, come out of the couch, pulls him in, bones crunch, blood starts gushing out, covering the guys, and they're basically freaking out. Once it's over, the alien then reveals his true dietary needs as human flesh. <laughs> so Alex knows that this is wrong. He doesn't want to be a part of it. But Mark, as a true friend, convinces him to go with it since this could be the solution to all their problems. Of course, this causes a chain of events that leads their friendship to be questioned as Alex and Mark continue to feed the couch human flesh. Alex decides he wants to end this, and with the help of Nicole, who's actually a researcher, and she is majoring as a librarian, because we're in Florida, uh, they find the couch has lived on to this earth through generations and has actually been involved in the worst uh, events in human history, causing just craziness. So Mark, desperate to have a better life, decides to kidnap Nicole and tries feeding her to the couch, which brings us to the final climax, where Alex, Mark, and the couch basically battle it over uh, Nicole. In the end, Mark realizes his friendship with Alex is more important, sacrifices himself to save Alex and Nicole, destroying the couch by burning the apartment complex down in the end. And that is the couch. <laughs> what, what, what part of that was based on uh, the, the, the real the, events? The friendship, the bar, <laughs> the drug dealing, all that fun stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like you know, you, what's so funny is you said it was a dark comedy, but this is a stoner comedy. Yeah, dude. You know, just stick in that genre. Just okay. embrace the Harold and Kumar, mm -hmm. embrace um, the Bill and Ted's of it all. Sure. It's like Little Shop of Horrors meets something. You know, it, it's absurd. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but like, once you start, you didn't hit Alien Couch until like five minutes in. Yeah. Like, let's bring that up. Bring okay. that somewhere. So then I know what we're watching, how we're supposed to watch it. Yeah. And I know, oh, I'm supposed to watch this kind of a little drunk and maybe a little stoned and you know, that's it. Great. Yeah, so I'll put it up in the log line pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you definitely buried the lead there. Okay. But uh, yeah, it's, 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 I thought the same thing, Little Shop of Horrors, um, which is a good comp, but uh, yeah, you should definitely move that up front. Cool. What would you shoot with the studio space? Uh, the apartment sequences like that for sure would be the ones to actually do it inside of a studio. Have as much control as possible to do that. I'm very big on practical effects, so that's what I would try to do. Do you have it, I mean, in your head, do you have a cast? Do you, do you have, is it cast at all? Do you have people you would shoot with? I do, I mean, I still have the script and process of writing, probably about 50% of it, uh, but the story's been going for years, so I've got every single outline I want. 
Um, not actors per se. I'm, I'm a filmmaker. I went to film school and I've got a massive Rolodex of crew and a lot of people who have practical effects and stuff. So that part of it, I bring in a lot with me. Uh, but yeah, with actors and stuff like that, there's maybe one or two that I've thought of, um, but nothing concrete. Aside from losing the boss's drugs, uh, what were their, their problems that this couch is gonna, you, you kind of said, oh, the couch will solve all their problems. It, it, it would extend. Um, I mean, Mark, th there's a few other beats in the story that, uh, that we would want to put down. Obviously, once the, the couch gets human flesh and becomes to extend and come out of the couch with tentacles and stuff, because of it's an apartment complex, uh, there is a sequence in my outline where we actually do have it going in and causing havoc through the apartment complex and bringing in some things which either benefit the two guys or it doesn't, just for its own purpose. So the couch is mobile? It can't move, but the alien can extend. So okay. think about pipes and things like that in an apartment complex, it can actually, and it's all drywall in Florida. So you can kind of break in through a hole and like a rat. Right on. Anybody else? Cool. All right, thank you very much. Thank you guys. All right, we've got two more, we're on the home stretch. Um, let's see, Brittany Ray. Hello, um, my name's Brittany. I'm a writer-director. Um, I have a film uh, screening tomorrow that I wrote and directed, and it's my second time film, uh, screening a film at Mammoth. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, my, uh, my film um, showing tomorrow is called Water, and it was uh, a part of the Sundance Lab and um, was awarded a grant from Sundance, and, um, and it's really cool. But um, today I wanted to um, share with you um, a psychological thriller logline I have. Um, an awkward sixth grader struggles with gender identity in the midst of survival when orphaned and left in the care of her manipulative and pedophilic uncle who shaves her head, takes her out to late night red lit sushi bars and introduces her as his nephew. Um, this is based on my actual real life um, so it's super special to me. I have, uh, I have so many um, uh, projects that I actually have materials for and have written, and this is like not one of them, but for some reason I felt moved to bring this one up. This is my first time bringing it up to anyone. So yeah, that's it. <laughs> Jordan Sweet, okay. Thanks. <laughs> so uh, psychological thriller feature film. Yes. Do you have a script written for this yet? No, I have a one pager. Okay. The hero is the little girl. Yeah. Um, what is she seeing? What's the journey? Why are we, uh, what does she want? What's uh, the obstacles in front of her? How does she, how, do, how does it resolve? Yeah, so, can, can you tell us a little more about, or, yeah. on the story? That would be nice. Yeah, so she, um, her parents were both um, heavy drug addicts and uh, she, was um, adopted by her grandparents who her uncle never like left home. And he's this like, if I could describe him, he's like this like less enthusiastic Tiger King type dude uh, <laughs> who like is in the back room like watching The Simpsons in a recliner chair, like doesn't have a job and stuff like that. And, um, and, um, and she is this like, really awkward 11 year old girl who um is not is like her body's changing she has no mother so she like has no access to like bras or like any type of like um anything that you should be introduced to like she's growing armpit hair doesn't know what to do about it um and she's wearing her pe uniform from middle school because it's like the only thing that's like comfortable because her body's like <laughs> awkward and so um she gets lice and um her uncle I guess they just decide like the that the only option is to just shave her head um so it this is before makeup and everything and now she looks kind of like uh gender ambiguous and he thinks it's like funny so he like takes her out and like introduces her as his nephew and she's very shy and awkward and obviously going through a lot of trauma um so yeah it's just like coming over adversity type 
story and um, yeah, like her just like surviving through that, I think. Is it a Little Miss Sunshine-esque, would you say? For sure. Okay. Yeah, I heard pedo uncle in there somewhere, so I didn't yeah. know how dark we were getting. Yeah, kind of like, um, I <clears throat> wouldn't, I, it's super dark and I don't think like, yeah, that's really dark, but, um, and I'm actually, I usually do a lot of comedy in, in um, like lighthearted, quirky, weird, like Wes Anderson type um, humor in my, in my stuff, but um, so, um, but yeah, I feel like she's, like he's definitely grooming her um, throughout and there's like different things that he does. Like he makes her like uh, work out and, and he makes her run back and forth. At, like he'll, he'll take her to the park and make her run back and forth and tell her that she's fat and she's growing a mustache and all this stuff or whatever. And like there's this weird grooming thing that he's doing with her because she's not like pretty enough for him. Um, although he is like into both like uh, girl and boys, little children or whatever but I don't think you ever see anything actually happen I'm, I'm not totally sure but like it's just implied that like something weird and fucked up is happening but what I think is really cool about it is that um there's this like element of they're both very lonely and there's this weird like connection that happens where like in their relationship with each other they re like there's this kind of like unspoken like abuse between them but they are actually like kind of it's fucked up but they're kind of like become best friends because they're they don't have anybody else so like it's this uncle who's like fucked up and this little 11 year old girl who's like okay but I don't really have anyone else so yeah maybe I will like hang out with you or you know yeah. and go with you to these like sushi restaurants and sure like I'll let you treat me like I'm a boy and stuff <clears throat> So is she having genuine gender Gen issues? Yeah. Or is it like, it almost sounded accidental where she got lice not to shave her head and then he's trying to mold her into something. Right, he's trying to mold her into something. It's definitely just like, it. I don't think it's just, it's is gender it, issues because it's kind of like, w am I supposed to be this? Um, right, but it's not necessarily coming from her. She's no. sort of caught in the middle. Yeah, no. Because it just, almost sounds like she's willing to explore uh, gender in that way, almost because he's forging a relationship with her uncle. Totally. You know and, what I mean? Yeah, and she just feels uncomfortable in her skin in general, which is something that I think, like, obviously every young middle schooler can relate to, like, just not really knowing how your body's changing and, and stuff like that. So it's kind of, yeah, and, like, growing, like, body parts that are, like, you know, you don't really know what to do with them, and so you don't, you're not familiar with it. So, it, yeah, it's a question. You know, it brings up an interesting point, like um, sometimes stories aren't ready to be pitched yet, you know, and so you get a little early, but you're getting good feedback from us because at least we're interested in the jumping off point. Um, so I think that's a positive, but it definitely needs to be workshopped and get into a script form or even an outline form so that way you can answer the questions more definitively. What are we going to see? What's the journey of a little girl and how does, how does it resolve? But um, yeah, I think just for coming up with a log line, it's, it's an interesting story. It sounds very timely and important, so. Cool. Yeah, I do think it's an important issue, especially for kids who are, you know, you're talking about a sixth grader, you know, where mm -hmm. gender's a confusing idea, and there's a lot of debate about how to handle, you know, people switching genders, and it's a hot, you know, it's a highly debated topic, and kind of almost taboo, so it's, not, I would go right at that with this. Totally. And you, you're saying, it's more of a dark comedy, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it's great, because you can explore the issue with comedy, so it's hidden a little bit in the genre, which yeah. is always a nice way to do it, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, last one, Ralph. We have Ralph in the house. Thanks, Thanks for doing this. Um, my name is Ralph D'Amato. I'm a producer. I've been a producer for quite a few years. I started off in the video game industry, um, moved through the websites and all that, and did our first film, which was a documentary we showed here at Mammoth uh, 2020, won a couple of awards, which we were stoked about. Uh, director did the pitch here, and uh, we showed our short from that pitch. Uh, we, we did that, and that was in the genre block last night. So stoked on Mammoth. Thank you, Tanner. <laughs> um, so this is a, a, a new concept. It's, a, it's my film is called uh, Mussolini's Family. Um, it's 
uh, the logline goes as uh, Italian immigrant husband and father of four, chases the American dream, but when World, World War II disconnects him from all communication with his family in Italy, for six years, his dream becomes his family's tragedy. <clears throat> it's an epic drama that's near and dear to me because it's, it's my family. Um, my grandfather got on a boat in Italy um, to chase the American dream uh, for our family to come over to the United States. And literally the moment he got on the boat, he kind of turned his back on our entire family, um, womenizing on the boat. And, uh, and then once he got off the boat for six years, World War II started, so six years there was zero communication between him and my family that was left back in Italy. Uh, and that family consisted of his wife and uh, four kids. He left when my mother was six, six months old, so she never really got to, got to see him. Um, so during that time, six years, he established a business, became very successful here in, in America, while my family was struggling back in Italy to try to make ends meet. Um, there's a love story that's, that's tied into this between my, uh, my mom and my dad. Uh, they lived in a little town in Italy where, at a time where um, their DMs were basically giving a note to a cousin who would then give it to another cousin that would give it to my mom and back and forth. So there's a bit of a love story that, that overarches in this as well. Um, there's a, a twist of an ax murderer that's also in my family, so it, it kind of drifts into some darker a aspects. Um, and so as a child, I only, I only knew my grandfather as Mussolini. That's what my entire family uh, referred to him as. And the, the movie kind of starts in a, a school setting, which is 100% true. I was in junior high. Teachers starting to teach us a little bit about World War II. He mentions the Axis and Allies and throws out the name Mussolini, at which I raised my hand and he said, Ralph, what do you got? And I said, that's my grandfather. Mussolini is my grandfather. He said, no, no, I don't really think Mussolini would be. No, 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 he's my grandfather, I assure you. So it kind of goes from that point on uh, where the story is told between uh, the mother and the son of, of this epic journey of, of how this family came to be. And then sort of the overarching theme is how my family struggled to get to America and attain the American dream. My brother and I both go to college, and, uh, and now really all I want to do is get back to that little town. You know, and I've, I've established my Italian citizenship, and the plan is eventually to just go back, get out of all the the hustle and bustle and all the craziness that's happening here, and just live a slower life. And that's uh, Mussolini's family. Great. I had a question about time and location. So you mentioned World War II. Is this a period piece? Yeah. And is there, do you explore multiple times in history? Yeah, there's gonna be multiple times in history. I mean, it, it kind of takes that, that it starts at that point, but then there's multiple, and there's flashbacks and, and so forth that, that take you to modern day. Are we in New York? New York, um, the locations are, so there'd be um, the garment, my, my grandfather, which again, I, I, I fail to remember his name. I know it's Vincenzo, but I only know him as Mussolini. Um, he developed an amazing garment factory in New York. Um, so there'd be that factory, there'd be scenes on the boat, um, I have access to that little town. I still have a home in that little town. It's about 300 people. There's a castle. My wife and I were married in that castle in 2015. Um, cost us about 100 euro. So I have full access to that town. Um, and, and they're on board to, to help me as well. So we've got uh, a few different other locations, but. Yeah, I think the only thing I wanted to hear in the pitch was I got a sense of your personal connection to the story, but I didn't get a sense of the family. Mm -hmm. Like, the, the uh, does family prevail? I wrote down, you know, what are those family struggles? Um, I can see if, if we're flashing to the 50s, the mother telling the kids certain things and they go out and doing what their kids are gonna do in the 50s, but what is that interesting family dynamic that's gonna make sure. us fall in love with that family and then does the family prevail? Like, sure, yeah, yeah. So. yeah, I can add that in for sure. I have that, I just didn't. This is the first time I've ever pitched. Yeah, that's why pitches are so, tough. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta yeah. put it all in there in a short, short amount yeah. of time. Anybody else got any feedback? And uh, it, it seems like this is a very uh, close story to you, obviously. Uh, what is, what's gonna make it have a broad appeal for just the average person? I think it touches on, you know, just the, the family aspect of, of dynamics within families uh, that, that, 
that tear th the fabric of, of them apart. Um, so I think that's a universal thing. It's just not, not an immigrant story. There is that immigrant story. But I think the other twist of this family that went through this epic struggle to get here and for the betterment of their kids, and really my parents did everything for my brother and I, everything that they could. Um, and then now we're here and we're successful, but what was it all worth it? And maybe it was better just to stay in that small little town where it's, you know, you've got people living to 100, eating great food, um, drinking wine, making homemade tomato sauce and, and all that good stuff. So yeah, that's sort of, I think that appeal will, will, will cross over. I hope. <laughs> so, so I'd probably work on your log line a little bit. Like, this is not an immigrant tale. This is an American tale uh, through the eyes of an immigrant family who tries to find their footing in America over multiple generations um, and the trials and tribulations they're in. Like, that, that, that really encapsulates okay. what, what's going on, I think. Yeah. Do you know the book uh, Cien Anos de Soledad? It's like 100 Years of Solitude. No. Uh, it's about a family over 100 years. All right. and, uh, I think it's Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Marquez yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that might be something to just check out. Okay. And, and, you know, tonally, maybe there's some similarities and yeah. see how that's structured. See, my, uh, my, my dad passed away. Both my parents have passed away. Um, but he used to go to Italy every year. And I would take him to the airport. And I would literally just hit record on my phone and ask these stories. So I have everything written down. Like, I, not written down. I've got it all. All of these stories I've have recorded, I, I've got an outline. I just need help in furthering it and getting it to that point. But I appreciate the feedback. Yeah, it's interesting. Cool. Studio time. What would you do with it? Studio time. I like I said, there's the scenes on the boat. There are the scenes with there are a bunch of different epic scenes that we have within the garment um, factory. Because uh, slowly but surely, um, he actually got a divorce. They, there was a there was a struggle between the divorce with my uh, grandmother in Italy. He did remarry, had another family here. But part of that divorce, he had to bring the kids over one by one. And he did so making sure they were about 18 so he didn't have to take care of them each time. And so each time they, they started working in his factory where he really was taking advantage of them from the point like my, my aunt would, um, he, he told her when, he, when, she, when she came over when she was 18, she started working for him. And he basically said, look, I'm gonna give you $30 a week but I'm gonna take 15 because that's how much it cost me to bring you over. So he was, he was just a really unique individual. Very cool. Yeah. Anyway. So I think the studio time will be in, in the garment, you know, in all these different scenes in, in the factory and in uh, the boat and, you know, Italian meals and all that good stuff. Great, anybody else? Do you have any funding yet? Do not, do not, no. Do you have a budget? Really, I mean, it's, it's a range based on what a studio wants to do with it. Um, you know, I, I, I see it somewhere in the one to five million, personally, I, you know, I think, I think in that range. I, I, I you know, it, the acting and the, and the locations and, and just the detail, I think it, it warrants um, a higher kind of level of budget. And do you have a full script? I do not, I have an outline. So I think when you just said, what threw me off a little bit was like, it depends on what a studio wants to do with it. I need to know what you want to do with yeah. it. Yeah. So. I would know. like to make it as epic as possible. So I'm, I'm more on the, you know, on the upper end of that budget. Okay. I kind of I see in my head, I have it pictured, you know, and actors and, and, and such that, that, and just knowing, again, I'm, I'm kind of new in the film biz that was, 2020 was my first one. Um, but just kind of knowing a little bit about the cost of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think it's just important, though, like from a pitch perspective, <clears throat> if you don't, if, if we're going to invest money and time to help you build your vision and you don't even know what your vision is, we're, we're, we're going to tune out. So right. the minute you said, yeah, whatever the net, whatever the studio wants no, to do. Not so, so much. Uh, make yeah, sure you maybe, own your sure, big ideas. Also. Sure, yeah. 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 Thank you. you. No, I, I was going to say, just back to what your point was, the central question of like what a family is willing to sacrifice for their kids. And this is an immigrant story, but it's also universal in that Yep. Parents give up a lot for their kids. Yeah. You know? They stay in terrible jobs and whatnot. And, but I thought it was an interesting question that would they have been better off had they stayed at home? Mm. If that's the case, you, you might want to explore the story of people who did stay at home and what happened to them because you, yeah. you'd want to understand that. But I, I do like that question, and that is a theme, a central theme that you can build around. If you, if you go back to look at your outline and focus it on that through line, I think um, is an interesting direction. Great. Thanks. Cool. Thanks for that.
Great. Great job. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, that concludes the pitch for today. Thank you for everybody who uh, got up and had the courage to pitch and share their big idea. Um, thanks to all the panel members for sitting with us for two hours. It was hopefully heard some good thank stuff. You. We want to thank Pathwater, Honey Drop. Um, thanks to everyone tuning in on the metaverse, whatever that is, wherever it is. <laughs> um, uh, compelling Pictures, Marina Studios, of course, uh, the Mammoth Media Institute, and just friendly reminder, we're going to put our heads together and announce the winner uh, at the awards show tomorrow evening at the Canyon Lodge. Cool? All right, enjoy the rest of the festival.